Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word together, to think about it. I just ask that you would take in this time and minister the truth of your word to our hearts to filter out all of that which is foolish and ignorant, just but seal to our hearts the truth of thy word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, we're studying together in the epistle to the Philippians verse by verse, and we read in chapter 3 verse 10, where Paul says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And I remind you that our Lord was delivered because of our transgressions, but was raised because of our justification. He was raised because we were made righteous. His resurrection was confirmation that we were made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that we saw was the righteousness of God. It is uh, the, His righteousness, the righteousness of God by the faithfulness of Christ, not by our faith. We're not saved. We're not redeemed or saved because of our faith in Christ, but because Christ is faithful. That's what our text has shown us. The power of his resurrection was the seal that his work was sufficient. So it was by his resurrection that we were made righteous in him. Therefore, the text is telling us, it has been telling us, that these are the things that were to set our minds on. Being made conformable unto his death, we are we are being made conformable unto his death. We were not redeemed through the human merit system, nor are we saved or or are delivered by it. And our Savior made this clear to both the high priest as well as the apostle Paul. So we know we we can have an experiential knowledge of. The fellowship of his sufferings when we encounter uh, identical or similar adversaries and we're reading here that we uh, that we know the fellowship of, of his suffering because of primar primarily because of uh, when we look at his death, that's one thing. And then our being identified with him in his death, that's another thing. Uh, we have the fellowship of his sufferings. What his death meant in as far as his, him dying in our place, as well as our being co-crucified with Christ, where that we died to self. And we know, we know from the word that unless we've died to the law, we cannot live unto God, but it wasn't just the law. We also died to sin. Uh, Romans 6.11, we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. We are new cre creations in Christ, folks. We've been given a new nature. We were born again by a very special process. Uh, that process was not initiated by us. It was initiated by God. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, toward the end of this video. But uh, the gospel is what we labor together in. And uh, I've made a number of videos explaining to you at least our position here at Blessed Hope Forever on what I believe the gospel to be. And of course, everyone knows that, well, the gospel is that Christ died, uh, uh, was buried, raised again, uh, according to the scriptures, 
But man seems to want to add something that he must do to that gospel, to that good news. And the good news is not something that we need to do, but the good news is what Christ has done. That is the good news. And when we preach that good news, okay, when we preach that, his people will hear because he says, my sheep hear my voice. So we carry the gospel. We carry the gospel as we carry our heart around. And as a result, we rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't rejoice in, in self. We don't rejoice in the flesh. We don't rejoice uh, over the fact that we are uh, somehow, you know, because of our, our own uh, best foot forward that we're able to accomplish anything in the Lord's. So we're not rejoicing in ourselves. We're rejoicing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Just that one statement that we rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ should tell you people a lot about how we are to walk and conduct ourselves in the short time that we have here. So we carry that gospel along with us. Uh, not only is his return near, the text is telling us that his return is near, but his presence is near. Is in, in the immediate sense, you know, without taking anything away from the fact that his, his physical return is, is in the near future, which I believe it is, he's omnipresent. He's always present in our lives. We can talk with him. We can, we can commune with God openly, freely. We can, as Hebrews tells us, we can boldly approach the throne of grace because God has made that, that uh, accessible to us. Uh, in other words, we don't have to bring anything as, as far as a sacrifice of ourselves to God when we come before Him for anything. But we come before him with the absolute understanding that Christ died in our place and his death was sufficient, that we don't have to add anything to it. We've seen a lot of marvelous truth in this epistle, and it amazes me how it, it doesn't matter what chapter, what verse that we're looking at, what paragraph, you know, as there were there were no paragraphs in the original text, but our our translators have so divided, separated, distinguished uh, sections uh, of this book, uh, and even giving the sections titles uh, and numbering the verses uh, primarily so that we would know where we're at in the text and we don't get lost. But it, it amazes me how that it doesn't matter what section that we look at, we see the beauty of Christ, the wonders of Christ, the glory of Christ, our focus is on Christ. That is our focus, folks. And it seems to me that today that the Christians in the main, they're interested in every, anything and everything but Jesus Christ. That he's worshiped, it seems almost in name only. But as far as doctrinal truth is concerned, sound doctrine, and, and how that, that doctrine impacts our lives and changes our lives, very few seem to be all that interested in it. And it is because of these things that we are to let our gentleness be made known to all men. Now, some have translated that yieldness. Uh, I... I was reading some of the commentaries, and uh, uh, one of them wanted to, to translate that yieldness. We are to uh, allow our yieldness to God to be made known unto all men, and not, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't argue against that. I, I think that we should do that, but I don't believe that that's what the text is saying. I think that the grace of God in our lives leads us, okay, leads us to be uh, show gentleness toward all men. Why? I mean, when you consider the opposite of gentleness, which is hardness, harshness, 
roughness, okay? Uh, I guess you could uh, almost look at it that way. Uh, it's, you know, we're trying to win an argument. We're trying to, uh, as, like some attorney in a courtroom, we're trying to win our case at all costs. And the tendency, or at least the temptation at times, is to get a little huffy and to uh, care more about winning the argument than anything else. And we are to be uh, show our gentleness. Let that gentleness be made known to all men. Communion with God, folks, has been made available because it's needful. It's needful to those of us who are in Christ where that we have such a bold access, the access that we do have to the Father, which is by grace. It's by grace that we have that bold access. Uh, we don't have to do anything to earn uh that that access to God. Uh, it's you can't help but see the heart of a loving God who desires our fellowship and desires that that we commune with Him in a personal, intimate way, without any reservations, without any feelings of a uh, uh, lack of 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 uh, inadequacy on our part. Like, you know, as if, well, we're just not worthy. Y'all feel so unworthy. Folks, our only worthiness is that the position that we've been placed in in Christ. It's based on, on the standing that we have in Christ, uh, the, the truth concerning who we, who we are in Christ and how we became the righteousness of God in Christ. It should prompt us to to not be fearful of approaching our majestic God because he's made that he's made that available to us by grace uh, he's concerned about our every need he we have a peace with God that surpasses understanding he guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, back in Colossians, we learned that, uh, that our life is hid with Christ in God. Folks, dearly beloved, you are absolutely righteous. Okay, If this day you do not believe that you are as righteous as God's Son, that when the Father looks at you, He sees you as righteous as His Son, that you stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ. If you do not believe that, I hurt for you. If you don't believe that, folks, then you haven't appropriated the truth of the text that we've been looking at. It's always been my heart's desire that others would come to know the Lord in all the, with all the, in all the fullness of, of all the blessings that they've received in Christ, that we've knowing that, that, that they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenlies. And yet I see so few interested in that. You seem to be interested in just about anything and everything but that. It's just too hard a truth to, to accept. It boggles my mind, dearly beloved, that, that God tells me that I stand before Him clothed in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ Himself. Now, if all I did was look at my life day after day and, and, and evaluate uh, that truth or try to, de try to determine that truth, on, on, the, on the basis of how I perform or how I, how I act, you know, whether my, my mind's always in the right place, my heart's always in the right place, when I know the heart is de deceitful and wicked above all things, if, if I was just to try to understand that from a human, purely from a human perspective, and bring my feelings and my emotions and all of that in there into that and try to 
determine whether, you know, it's, I guess I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this, but it, I just don't, you know, I don't feel righteous, okay, is, is what we would say, you know. It's, I can't believe that that's, that that's true. Now, I mean, that may be true of others, but certainly it's not true of me. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, dearly beloved, that it is. It's true of every single saint in Christ Jesus. He calls us saints. He calls us saints. So we were raised with him. We were raised with him to walk in newness of life. We, our feet stand on resurrection ground even while we are here, awaiting the redemption of our bodies. You were raised with Christ. And you weren't raised when you decided to be raised, okay? God placed you in Christ. He buried you with Christ. He raised you with Christ. And since that's true, then we are to set our minds on those things where Christ sits at the right hand of God. His work is finished. Why does it say sits at the right hand of God? Because Jesus Christ's work is finished. And we can't add a thing to it. I think the the concept of of the nearness of the Lord, the the fellowship with the Lord, is is foreign to many Christians. We recognize that He was able in the past to redeem us, and and that someday He's coming back to reign. But in in the meantime, in the time in between, you know, we're just we're just casting our lot with everyone else who's struggling to gain acceptance with God. I wish I could really put it into words, folks. How, I wish I could tell you just how many years I have lived and walked with the Lord and not done that. I don't get up in the morning thinking of, of how I can, I can uh, somehow gain acceptance with God this day, you know, or maintain some semblance of of acceptance, you know, before God. Or to bounce back and forth, you know, from the flesh to the spirit and, you know, allow my emotions to rule instead of what the text is saying. That's our greatest chance, one of our greatest challenges is to not, not filter all of this through our own personal experiences, okay? Look in the Bible, folks, at how many times God's people have failed miserably, and yet God says, like as he said of David, he was a man after God's own heart. We don't seem to realize that the walk of the Christian is an ever-present walk in the victory and the presence of and the life of our Lord because of what He's done. So much focus on what we do, what we've done, what we should do, what we think we should do. Whether we live either too much in the past, so we're either living in the past or we're living in the future, but we're not really living in the moment. And, and, in, and in the present moment, folks, dearly beloved, in, in this present moment, you stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Why? Because you've, you've lived in such a way as to reflect that? No, but because of what Christ has done. Not only is His presence near, near us, He's right here with us all the time. In fact, He's in us, but, but He's also with us. His return, His physical return is near. I don't have a whole lot to say about September. I'm going to leave that to everybody else. I'm gonna, it's not what I've been called to do at this present time. The Lord has made it clear to me to focus on the text, nothing else. And that's what I'll continue to do, God willing. 
He's there to talk to, folks. He's there to talk to. He's there to fellowship with. He never leaves us. He, he's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He always causes us to triumph. Always causes you to triumph. Oh, but Steve, that just can't possibly be true. It is. Now, we can choose to believe God that He always causes us to triumph, or we can not. Most Christians don't think that they triumph. I suppose they'd prefer the verse say, well, some of us triumph, or once in a while we triumph, but it doesn't say that. He always gives us the victory. He always causes us to triumph. And there is no lack, no lack, in what God has done for us in Christ. You know, we, we love quoting, you know, not by our strength or nor by our might, but by his spirit, saith the Lord, and yet we rarely live like it. We worry about everything. And yet we're told to be anxious for nothing. I see God saying, don't worry about anything and in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God combined with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And I've pointed out in the past, I'll keep saying it. If all we ever did was give thanks to God for what he's done, what he is presently doing and what he will do in the future, folks, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. If our worship and our prayer, and a lot of that is when we talk about worship and prayer, we tend to separate the two, and the two are, are, are married to one another. If, if we let our worship and our prayer with God it isn't centered in that, in that frame of reference, then we're not where we can, we can be. Okay? We can be. If we, if we just trust God in what He said. We've seen from the text that, that it says that we have a joy unspeakable, that we have a love that is never ending. You know, we, we tend to gripe and complain about our circumstances when we have a peace that passes understanding. Not, not a peace that, that, that doesn't mean, that's not talking about a peace which no one can understand. It, but the peace of God which no human mind, could, natural mind, could have reasoned out because it came to us from God. It's beyond the capability of human reasoning or human logic. It's, it's, it's not beyond the capability of our understanding it in the spirit, but it is beyond the capability of human logic. No one from the standpoint of human merit can know the peace that we have with God. It doesn't come from the mind of man. And that's, that's what I see in that expression, which passes all understanding. This is God's peace. Folks, God has nothing against you. So God just, God separates that from the area of human reasoning, from, from law and the flesh, you know, from human merit. A peace that can do nothing but guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It is in that area of trust in God that God guards our hearts and minds in Christ. If your mindset is constantly worrying about other fleshly, earth, earthy, natural things, you'll probably guard that. Okay? I, we are looking at our walk and our fellowship and our communion with God. And God guards the new man, not the old man. The old man was, was what was crucified with Christ. Christ has always been the focus, folks, from chapter 1, verse 1.
You've got to see the beauty in that. And, and it's not just in this epistle. It doesn't matter where you go. I, and, I, and I'll even so, go as far as to say it doesn't matter if it's the New Testament or the Old Testament. The focus, the, the, the ministry, the focus, the primary focus, the primary interest of God the Holy Spirit is in, is in presenting to us the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And he does this through so many real life examples of those who have gone before us. And now here in verse 8, we're shown eight things. Verse 8, eight things. I count eight things. I, uh, I counted them several times to make sure it was really eight things. Eight things in verse 8. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. And if you, we wanted to go on and read verse 9, it's those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, allow me to try to, well, allow me to suggest what I believe that is not saying, okay? It is not whatever we want to make these things out to be, these eight things. It's, you know, we could fill in the blank. We, each one of us could, you know, just pass out the index cards and each one of us can write down what we, what we think all this stuff is, you know, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, you know, this, uh, I do not believe that it is speaking of, of whatever or what, you know, whoever or whatever you think that supports your theological position or your political position or any, any other position at all or however you define uh, plain, just pl simple, plain and simple morality. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard, actually heard, heard Christians tell me, you know, that there are different forms of, well, that's your morality. That's your morals. Okay, I got my own set of morals. I mean, that's, we can get lost in all of that mess. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. It's, okay, whatsoever things are, are this and this and this and this. Eight things, he goes through eight things. Okay, think on these things. It's, they're obviously things. It's plural. Okay, these are things. It, you know, if, if I didn't know we were under grace and, and I believed we were under law, then I'm, I'm going to, right away, I'm just going to look at it, it, read this text, and I'm going to say, well, then uh, I need to pursue truth, and I need to pursue the, uh, an honest, uh, you know, don't cheat on my income tax. Honest, okay? Whatsoever things are just. Okay, and pure. Uh, I don't know. Pure does that does it, would pure would that include uh, uh, a bottle of spring water? Uh, whatever whatever things are lovely. Well, would that would that in, would that in, would that include a uh, an a uh, uh, sixty nine Oldsmobile four forty two uh, blue. Uh, with bucket seats, uh, leather seats, and uh, chrome wheels, and uh, in mint restored to mint condition. That's, I mean, to, to me, that's pretty lovely. Would that? I mentioned that because that was my first car I had when I was seventeen. Is it? Is that? Is that one of the things I'm supposed to think of? Whatever things are of good report, good report. If there be be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
What is the text telling us? Here is the question. What is the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, what is... I'm curious as to what he's expecting of us here. Oh, well, it's, uh, let me see. Uh, whatever things are, are true and honest. Okay, well, that, so that's, you, that means it's better to be a Republican. Okay? That's what that means. Or Democrat. You know, you know, it's really saying Republican, okay, where that now that you can you can reach the conclusion that you really doubt whether anyone who's a Democrat is a is a real Christian, and you know, and you, you know, you but you might be a Democrat and reach the position that no one who's a, a Republican is born again. And my point, folks, here is that we could compile a really long list of things that seem to fit these eight things and I mean that list would be miles long and and they may in fact fit the description of these eight things it's it's but I'm going to argue that these eight things by themselves are not the dominant theme of the of the Christian life. Okay. If if you look at the Christian life and you think, well, it's just it's all about the flesh and law and living a a, a high moral life. You know, it's all about morality. Uh, well, then it makes all the sense in the world to look at it that way. And I I can't. I I'm sorry, folks. I can't look at it that way. And and please don't misunderstand me here. I, I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong at all with 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 these eight things in and of themselves by themselves. I'm not I'm I don't I'm not going to dare suggest that there's something that that's that that's not that's, that that has no value whatsoever. I'm not I'm not going to suggest that. I'm not going to suggest that there's anything wrong with working for world peace. Okay? But if that's the dominant theme of your life, it's it's not the person in the work of Christ. You know, you have the right to pursue good things. And you should. You should. But dearly beloved, the grand theme of this book as well as the rest of Scripture is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to suggest that uh, I, whatsoever things are true and are those things which are wrapped up in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Whatsoever things are honest are those things which are wrapped up in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What, whatsoever things are just are those things which are wrapped up in the person in the work of Christ. And, you, and we can go on down the list. The same thing applies for just all the rest of it. The same goes for honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, uh, virtue, praise. Okay? The same goes for, you know, all of it. It's the purpose of worship and, and requests, they have a context, folks. And that's the purpose of God in our lives. The context, folks. We're looking at an ecclesiastical context. We're not looking at a worldview context. We're not looking at a just a global, natural, earthly, fleshly, human, morality, law, works, context. Okay? We're, the context... The immediate context, the, the broader context, the overall context is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Prayer, uh, communion, uh, fellowship, worship, uh, intercession, praying for others. Uh, I believe they need to have some recognition of what God has done in our lives, what He's doing in our lives, what He's 
going to do, what He will in the future do in our lives. You know, which leads us to be satisfied with His provision in our lives. If, if we're completely satisfied with His provision in our lives, if we understand that God has nothing against us, that He loves us with an undying love, that when He's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. If, if we are comfortable in our own Christian skin, Just how much more do you think that we would be concerned about others? How can we be so concerned about others, which, which, which tends to be a great need, and as far as I see it in the text, it's, it's because it's, this is not all about us. How, how can we have such a, an honest, pure, just, uh, all of this that we read here, how can we have a, a sincere desire to see others grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ if we haven't come to at least first settle that dispute that uh, within ourselves as to just you know how much God accepts us on the human level? Well, he, the fact is, folks, He doesn't accept you on the human level. As far as it relates to you know his his acceptance being based upon your performance, we have been accepted in the beloved, made complete in Christ because of what Christ did. The flesh, the law, self has nothing to do with this at all. In fact, it is it makes up the other half of of our existence in which that conflict lies that it lies it's really in always in constant direct contact conflict with the truth of the word of god it's uh i believe that we are looking at things that have to do with things spiritual first and foremost that we're looking at these things in context of the context of our present study it's astounding to me. Just how many Christians today are dissatisfied with what God's given them. Well, he really hasn't given me very much. Except he's, he's laid out, you know, this, this uh, path for me, you know, this, he's made it clear what he wants me to do. And if, you know, if I do it, I'll be blessed. And if I don't, I won't. And it's, I've talked a lot about reversing God's order, putting the cart before the horse, preaching devotion first, blessing second. That's not what this book teaches, folks. Our devotion follows the blessings, the many blessings that we've received. God has blessed us so abundantly, so tremendously, so extraordinarily. He's, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And as a result of that, of our knowledge of that, and our belief and our trust in God concerning that, it's not hard to care about others. Because what we're wanting for others is the same thing that we wanted for ourselves. We came to realize that we needed, we wanted, and we needed to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And when we find that comfort and that rest in Him, then that's what we want for others. But no, no. No, he made a, God made a mistake in my marriage. You know, He made a mistake in my kids. My job. He definitely made a mistake in my looks or, you know, or my beauty or, or my strength or, or my health condition. You know, you can go on, on and on with that all day long. It seems to me that Christian after Christian is, is inferring in his prayer that God has not done things quite right. No wonder prayer is so associated with worship. Because we worship, and we worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
And so, no, I do not believe that the purpose, purpose of the, at least the primary purpose of prayer is to just to set these things right that have gone so wrong in our lives that we don't tend to like. I don't believe that's the purpose of worship and prayer. Our supplication is a fuller understanding of the process, the program, the work of God in our lives and in the lives of others. You don't have to pray. We don't have to pray. But I believe that the counsel in the heart of God is that we do. And I think it breaks his heart when we don't. Just all you got to do is try to imagine someone who loves you more than anyone could possibly love you. And yet you're afraid to approach them and, and commune with them and fellowship with them. Because you feel like you're unworthy. I don't believe that's the purpose of worship and prayer. But I believe that the counsel in the heart of God is, is that we grow in grace and knowledge of Him, that we understand who we are in Christ. At the very beginning, at least we've got to get our get get our identity down right okay you know what is a christian we have to ask that question in our own lives what is a christian who is a christian what does it mean to be a christian that's no, it's i know it's a definite worship centered in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to suggest that these things here, these eight things, are a lovely portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, that's, that's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, you, you can look at them as individual things, and I understand it's plural. These are things I can, I, if you want to disassociate that with the person and the work of Christ, be my guest. I can't do that. I can't. The context will not allow me to do that. We are seeing the characteristics of, I believe, and the natural expressions of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God. which we've been united together with in our inner man, our sinless new man, the new nature, which according to 1 John cannot sin. It cannot. Folks, we are in a conflict between the old and the new, the flesh and the spirit, law and grace. A constant daily conflict a struggle between the flesh and the spirit not that somehow somehow that the flesh can overcome all all of the difficulties all of the obstacles in our life and that's the challenge that's not the challenge the challenge is to recognize what god has done for us in christ and to recognize we've been crucified with christ so that the life that we now live in the flesh we live by the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ who loved us, who gave himself for us. And, and we, don't, we, don't make, we don't nullify the grace of God in our lives. Because if any, any righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing, folks. Okay? Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope that this helps us along a little bit. I wanted to get through this, at least this one section. We'll be back to talk more about this. We're in the fourth chapter. We won't be long before we'll complete this study through Philippians. I'm debating whether to go through Galatians next, if we're, if we're still here. Or... Uh, first second and third john so pray with me on that uh i want you to know that i pray for you all constantly 
I ask for your continued prayers for this, the direction of this ministry and my health. I want to thank you all for all of your lovely comments that you leave me, the comments that encourage me so much. I want to thank you all for those of you who, have, who are supporting this channel. We couldn't do it without you. I want to thank you. Sue and I both thank you from the bottom of our heart. Rest in him. Dearly beloved, rest in Him and spend some time in this book and spend some time in fellowship and communion with our Lord. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.